This Artificial Intelligence and Equality podcast is hosted by Carnegie Council Senior Fellow Wendell Wallach. Together with Anya Kasperson and an International Advisory Board, they direct the Carnegie Artificial Intelligence and Equality Initiative, AIEI, which seeks to understand the innumerable ways in which AI impacts equality and international affairs. This episode features Mark Rotenberg and Merva Hickok being interviewed by Wendell Wallach. It was recorded on July 24th, 2023. Hello, I'm Wendell Wallach. Many listeners will be aware that the Carnegie Council for Ethics and International Affairs has had a long-standing interest and involvement in the ethics of emerging technologies and their governance, particularly artificial intelligence. That is why I'm so pleased to be hosting this podcast highlighting the work of the Center for AI and Digital Policy also known as CAIDP, a small initiative which few of you may have heard of, but is nevertheless having an outsized impact. Today, we have two leaders of CAIDP, Mark Rotenberg, its founder and executive director, and Merva Hickok, president and research director. One piece of recent evidence that underscores CAIDP's influence is the FTC's announcement in mid-July about an investigation of open AI. Merv, for our listeners who are unfamiliar with the FTC, what is it and what did they announce? Thank you, Wendell, and thanks for having us on this podcast. Uh, Really appreciate it and good to see you again. Uh, Federal Trade Commission is the consumer protection, federal consumer protection agency in the United States, uh, regulating and overseeing the fair uh, trade uh, business practices. And also in the absence of uh, a privacy regulator in the United States, uh, it also uh, seeks to regulate this space and oversee this space as well. So it is not only for AI or for digital practices, but at a high level is the Consumer Protection Agency. And what did they announce? Well, we are very happy that uh, they recently announced uh, an investigation into open AI's business practices, as well as their data and uh, uh, data practices and policies and procedures. Uh, we have been, we can go into further detail, but we, we have been working on this uh, and demanding this investigation for a few months now. Um, and what they're seeking with that investigation is uh, policies and procedures regarding the open AI's data practices, model development, how they audit and moderate the outputs and what they've done to Uh, with regards to bias, transparency, privacy, safety, and deception risks. Mark, tell me a little bit more about what CAIDP did in March and early July to prompt the FTC to take this action. In March, when there was a lot of uh, focus on the release of uh, GPT 3.5, we became aware of the concerns that had been raised that Merva described from public safety and consumer protection on through uh, cybersecurity and misinformation. I had had uh, success in the past uh, bringing complaints to the Federal Trade Commission involving Google and Facebook, and this seemed like a good opportunity to put the matter before the FTC. Merva had just testified before a House committee about the need to establish AI guardrails. So we filed the complaint at the end of March and then um, carried forward a a campaign actually titled Open the Investigation, urging the FTC to begin uh, the investigation we had proposed. Um, One of our staff members here in Washington attended an open meeting of the commissioners and reminded them of our uh, complaint, asked them to take action. And just about a week before word leaked uh, that the FTC had opened the investigation, uh, we filed a detailed supplement. Uh, Altogether, we had over 80 pages of filings with the Federal Trade Commission outlining the concerns about chat GPT and what we thought the FTC should do. 
I think it's difficult for us to know who else may have prompted the FTC to act, but at least for people like myself, yours was the most visible. And uh, I was highly appreciative that you had not only taken this initiative, but it looked to me that that had been seminal in, in moving forward on this. Merv, can you tell us a little bit more about the Center for AI and Digital Policy, what it is and you know, what some of your activities are? Uh, how much time do we have? <laughs> uh, we are an uh, uh, independent nonprofit research and education organization. We are incorporated in DC. However, we operate on a global level. And we can summarize our activities under research and education advocacy and advisory. So on the research and education side, we run semester long AI policy clinics. And in September, we're about to start the sixth semester. So we've been doing this for a while. Uh, we've been uh, developing and scale, upscaling future AI policy leaders across the world. And we have seen more than 60 countries, participants from more than 60 countries who have graduated from our clinics. We also do uh, our flagship research uh, publication, AI and Democratic Values Index, uh, where we have been for three years now, uh, we've been looking at national AI strategies and practices of 75 countries. It stands as one of the uh, most comprehensive and comparative analysis on AI policy. Uh, we advise uh, both national, federal, and international and supranational organizations, anything from uh, European Union, United Nations, UNESCO, OECD, uh, UNITE, uh, GPI, as well as, uh, as Mark mentioned, some of the federal uh, and national agencies as well. So Mark, when you founded CAIDP, you'd already been very involved in policy making on the digital front in, in Washington. And I wondered what was it that led you to want to start this new body and what did you hope it would achieve? Well, Wendell, I've been in the field of AI uh, policy and work, I'm almost embarrassed to say, but it goes back um, more than 40 years um, before I became a lawyer, one of the few lawyers in our nation's capital, I might add. Um, I was a computer programmer and a chess player. And so I was uh, very interested in the problem of how we uh, write programs to play chess and to play backgammon. And I was involved in some of the early developments actually uh, lectured on uh, AI in programming um, when Jimmy Carter was president. That's how far back that all goes. Um, but to carry forward, the issue of AI as a digital policy issue, you know, has been ripe, I would say, for many, many years. It's only in the last year, perhaps, that the public has become engaged because of the widespread availability of generative AI products such as uh, ChatGPT. And what seemed most important to me was to establish a system of democratic governance for this new technology. And with the establishment of um, the center of KDEP, uh, we are trying to promote democratic governance. We're trying to promote the rule of law uh, and to ensure the protection of fundamental rights. And it's been very exciting, I would say, with the support of, of Merva and others to see the, the rapid de development of the field and, and the great interest we've received um, at the Center for this work. So Merva, is CAIDP more focused on domestic US policy or on international policy? Uh, we call ourselves a global nonprofit uh, and global uh, research and education organization. Uh, we are involved on both ends. Uh, so we've been involved obviously with the OECD and UNESCO work for a long time. And in the last two, three years have been heavily involved in the EU AI Act uh, conversations, advocacy and advisory end, as well as Council of Europe's uh, AI treaty work uh, for almost three years now. 
Uh, however, uh, in the last few months, uh, US AI policy has picked up significantly. Uh, so you are seeing us putting out advisories and recommendations and statements uh, more frequently on the US side. Mm -hmm. uh, and as Mark mentioned, I had the opportunity to testify in the first um, congressional hearing on whether US is ready for AI technology or not and how it should proceed. Um, I think US is right now picking up uh, speed on uh, AI policy and regulations. Other re regions have been more involved in this. And, uh, SCIIDP, we've been more involved in the international uh, policy. Uh, however, uh, there is definitely a need on US um, catching up and hopefully leading these efforts. So you see us uh, acting on both fronts. You mentioned earlier your um, major initiative, the Artificial Intelligence and Democratic Values Index. I'd appreciate it, and I'm sure our listeners would also, if you could tell us a little bit more about what that is and what you have discovered so far. Absolutely. Uh, and it, AI and Democratic Values Index is also one of the founding activities of the center. Uh, we started this as Mark mentioned, in an effort to um, assess the country, uh, you know, national AI policies and strategies and what actually the countries are doing. What do they commit to? What are they, what are, what are they actually doing on the, um, on the ground? So we have established 12 objective metrics and our effort was to create this comparative and longitudinal analysis of where the countries st stand against this uh, 12 metrics and how do they change over time. So in April of this year, we published the third edition. We look at 75 countries and their priorities and their national AI strategies, uh, their commitments and implementation of Universal Declaration of Human Rights, OECD AI principles, UNESCO AI recommendations, as well as some of the uh, convergence on the norms, uh, AI governance norms, such as transparency, fairness, accountability, um, etc. So it is a pretty extensive work and we've been uh, blessed with uh, the engagement of not only our uh, global academic network, uh, but also our uh, AI policy clinic participants. So more than 300 people uh, either do contribute to the research or uh, as you have been one of the uh, supporters and reviewers of this work to a peer review and peer review and uh, feedback process. Um, so it's not only us saying this is where we stand, but it is a truly global effort. Uh, and like I mentioned, uh, AI and Democratic Values Index has so, been, so far been uh, heavily used by policymakers and it is a, it stands as the most extensive original uh, analysis. Do you mind getting a little bit into the weeds with us here a bit? Because I know you are looking at this more as a means to catalyze countries to, um, to take up these concerns that you're evaluating them on, but, but I think you also are um, seen as a rating system. And I wondered if you could give us a sense of those 70 odd countries that you're evaluating, what percentage of them get, get high marks and uh, what percentage of them still have a lot to demonstrate? So every country is, as I mentioned, measured against these 12 metrics and they get a certain score uh, evidenced by the practices and evidenced by the public documentation. And then those scores allows us to kind of rank uh, each country. And then uh, every country is split into five tiers, depending on where they are with those scores. So there is a nice uh, bell curve uh, uh, spread as well, interestingly enough. And within those, as you mentioned, we are trying to catalyze change uh, and advancement through these uh, metrics hold the countries accountable for their actual practices and showcase the areas of developments uh, as well as where else 
uh, they can improve upon. So the countries at the very top uh, in tier one are actually the ones who implement what they committed to. So that stands as one of the biggest, um, uh, you know, the, the differentiators between the countries. Tell one us who some of those top tier countries are. Of course, so the top tier countries uh, are uh, right now are Canada, Germany, uh, South, South, South Korea, uh, and they you, you see them as um, they commit to, for example, transparency, and you see uh, their public consultations and all their AI policy um, development being very transparently uh, developed or uh, managed as well as public commentary to be included. You see them actually implementing human rights respecting practices. Uh, you see them implementing accountability mechanisms for the governments. So it, as we go down to the tiers, that gap between commitment and practice, actual implementation uh, widens. So you might see a country says, uh, you know, we commit to human rights, but then uh, heavily surveil their yeah. population or, or use uh, you know, mass surveillance or things like predictive policing, uh, et cetera, uh, which does not uh, align with those human rights respecting uh, commitments. So we try to make sure that we can surface those practices and. Uh, as you mentioned, drive change. Given that uh, you know the greatest body of our listeners are going to be from the U.S. and the EU, what what tiers do they fall in? Uh, so, uh, we, as an independent organization, doing this, uh, we are very careful that we are not uh, favoring or disfavoring uh, any country and stick to our metrics. So, U.S. sits in the middle. And over the years, we have seen uh, changes in the US policy. Uh, first, more activity happening in, in US policy, uh, but also uh, changes in transparency of how these activities are happening. Um, for example, first year of the report, we were very concerned about some of the behind the doors uh, activities happening with, for example, National Security Commission on AI. Um, We've done a number of activities and advocacy work to make the AI policy work in the US uh, more transparent. Uh, that has changed in the second year, uh, for example, with some of the OSTP public consultations. But then right now, uh, this year, we're seeing some of the, uh, again, behind closed doors uh, activities and meetings in the EU policy in US policy, uh, closed door meetings with CEOs uh, and uh, you know, closed door briefings to the senators, et cetera. So we try to keep on top of these uh, changes and activities to make sure that uh, our, um, our ratings actually are evidenced and uh, reflect the ac ac actual work. Mark, does, does, you know, you talked about working with the EU on their AI Act, and I wonder, does uh, the rating system enter into that conversation, or, or how does your, what should I say, your consultation with the EU, um, what, is, what is the emphasis there? Well, I think our rating system, and more generally the report AI and Democratic Values, um, has been very influential in our discussions with the members of the European Parliament and the Commission, the Council, and others. Our aim in creating uh, the methodology was to establish um, objective metrics that would allow countries to talk about uh, AI policy objectives as measured against, you know, we use the phrase democratic values, small d, but we have in mind such important uh, principles as as uh, Merva described, uh, transparency and fairness and opportunities for public participation. And it gives us the ability, for example, uh, to criticize the United States, as Merva mentioned, when the AI commission is set up in secret 
Uh, we think that's contrary uh, to democratic values and also to acknowledge uh, when the U.S. creates a more transparent process for public participation. It's very much an issue right now, for example, with uh, Senator Schumer, who has proposed a, a new uh, method for gathering uh, expertise for the U.S. Congress based on closed door briefings. And yeah. you see, we can go back to our methodology and say, as we've said now for several years in our review of all countries' policies and practices, uh, we simply disfavor closed door briefings. Uh, we think democratic governments should have an open uh you know, opportunity for participation. We think transparency is necessary, not only for accountability of algorithms, but also for government. So I would say, yes, um, the, the methodology as well as the narrative reports give us a, a very effective way to talk about positive and negative developments. You said democratic values with a small d, and I wonder how you understand that when you're looking at countries that are not democracies, um, but may in some respects um, honor what, what we might consider democratic values and whether this emphasis on democratic values um, is problematic in terms of your rating system being seen as universalized. universalized. Well, yeah. In fact, I think one of the great, um, I don't know if it's particularly in it, an achievement or an insight, but I think our methodology has worked remarkably well looking at both so-called democratic nations and so-called non-democratic nations, because we can recognize when democratic nations fail to uphold the values we would associate with a democratic country, such as public participation and decision-making, and we will also acknowledge in non-democratic countries when efforts are made to safeguard fundamental rights or to endorse the OECD AI principles or to put in place uh, legal uh, standards for algorithmic transparency. So the methodology has actually worked uh, remarkably well uh, across uh, all governments giving us the ability to, I would say, fairly and objectively uh, assess national AI policies and practices. Please, Merv, jump in. Uh, just to expand on your question about EU and European countries, Wendell, uh, we, as I mentioned, we've been involved with the EU AI Act for uh, multiple years now at, at this point and have also been involved with the committees leading this effort partnering with civil society organizations in the EU, uh, trying to drive the EU AI Act to be more rights respecting, mm -hmm. uh, uh, rather than how it started as a more of a safe product safety regulation. So uh, we have been pushing, advocating and advising towards that as well. But even when we look at European countries, as Mark mentioned, uh, we are able to keep an objective eye to the practices of these countries. So when you go deeper into the individual country reports and in the index for those countries in the Europe, in Europe, uh, you'll see that the practices uh, of the countries of the national governments again make this make it diff make the difference uh, in the ratings because. Uh, we are seeing issues with how uh, individual governments use AI and predictive techniques or surveillance techniques in border control or uh, fraud detection systems for minorities in, in the country or uh, just surveillance and control, population control in those countries. So uh, just because a country is in Europe uh, does not automatically uh, makes makes it high on, on the ratings. It is really how these countries implement those uh, rights respecting uh, policies as well as transparency and public engagement. Great, that's very helpful. I'm gonna pivot just a little bit and come back to some of your history. Um, Mark, you alluded to how long you have been in this field of digital governance. Can you just tell us a bit more about uh, your history and some of the activities you've been involved in going back? Well, we'll go beyond the Carter administration at least. 
So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I've, I've been involved in a lot. Um, at one stage, I was helping nonprofits in Washington, D.C. set up microcomputers. Um, that was fun. At another stage, I was working for the United States Senate on law and technology. Um, I did work in, in the privacy field and open government. I also was um, a founding board member of the organization that actually manages the .org domain and later served as chair. And I'm very proud of that work because a big part of the .org was about promoting the non-commercial use of the internet. And also actually with Computer Professionals for Social Responsibility, who I've been thinking about a lot recently, uh, we were very much involved in the early days of AI uh, policy. Um, and I really actually would credit CPSR, and this is about 40 years ago, uh, for first calling attention to the risks of automated decision making, particularly in the um, weapons context. Because you see this uh, debate today about how systems can take control and, and produce what is you know, described today as existential risk, but a number of years ago was simply automated warfare um, is a longstanding concern. And I actually am glad to see it come back into the policy world. I hope we'll see concrete action. I also hope we'll see concrete action on the immediate problems of, of algorithmic bias. Because, of course, we're all so dependent on automated decision making today. And so many of these systems reflect uh, social bias that needs to be addressed and corrected. So, um, yes, I mean, a lot of years working on these issues. But as we talk about it, I actually think most probably about CPSR. And they really were at the vanguard. Randall, can I just say that it is a great thing for me like I, I'm really honored and excited to be working with Mark for a long time now and at any given topic he either has a story or an article <laughs> that he has written or both uh, depending on, on the stuff but it it is really fun and exciting to be working with him someone who has uh, such an extensive knowledge or inside and out uh, as well as a network in, in this Yes, I, yes, I want to. I want to say the same thing. And having both worked together with Mark on some on some various projects, but also in that we are having you on this podcast today, I think people get a little caught up in who's in the public public eye. But there are people like yourself who have truly, uh, truly been burning the midnight oil for years, trying to anticipate the challenges and get our society up front as opposed to waiting to react you know, that sometimes is, is just too late for us to engage. I, I literally lost track of the number of people and organizations who, upon knowing that I work with Mark, tell me about their own stories of how he helped them either get established or become more uh, you know, visible and uh, get to your, to your point, working behind the scenes, but very passionate about the cause. Well, I hope sometime, you know, maybe in 20 or 30 years hence, people will go back and write a history of this period. And hopefully it's a positive history of how we uh, how we change their tra trajectory in the deployment of AI. And uh, if, if it gets written, Mark, you certainly deserve uh, more than a paragraph. But we will we will see how that unfolds. Well, I just want to say, first of all, thank you uh, both for the kind words. Uh, but when that history is written, I hope it's written by an actual person, because a lot of that seems to be in, in debate right now. And uh, I'm I'm uh, more uh, trusting, I think, of people than I am of of the machines. If it, if it is written by if it is written by a you know a machine rather than a person, we can be sure that the people who are more prominent in the press are going to be the ones who did everything, and uh, and those who worked long hours are perhaps uh, are perhaps overlooked. But that's uh, that's part of the problem we have with mach the machines these days. Mike, you were talking a little bit about, and both of you did about your work with um, OECD and for UNESCO, and I. I, you know, I'd like to hear a little bit more because I, I do know how seminal you've been in, in initiatives by both of those organizations. But Mark, also, you often stress the OECD principles rather than the UNESCO principles. 
and they are pretty similar. They overlap quite heavily. And I wondered why, why you often give, what shall I say, prior, um, prior credit to the OECD. Well, uh, part of it is chronological, but let me say a few words about the UNESCO recommendation on AI ethics. I'm a big fan. And in fact, we have adjusted our methodology in our AI and democratic values report to first recognize countries that have endorsed the UNESCO recommendation and second countries that have implemented the UNESCO recommendation on AI ethics. So those are two uh, favorable indicators and a, a lot of credit should go to UNESCO for uh, developing global support, I would say at the moment for the most comprehensive approach to AI ethics and regulation we've, we've seen to date. Um, but also, you know, OECD I've worked with for more than uh, 30 years. I am a big fan of the organization. I think they've done a very good job of setting out uh, frameworks, not regulatory, but let's say principle-based frameworks, uh, particularly for the digital economy uh, in such areas as consumer protection, computer security, encryption, and of course, the very famous uh, OECD uh, privacy guidelines of 1980, which literally became the foundation for many national uh, privacy laws and international agreements, arguably one of the most um, influential uh, policy frameworks uh, from anyone at any time. Um, but if I can say one more word on this, uh, because I did work as an expert in the drafting of the 2019 OECD AI principles, which I think were very good, but we might also say more limited than what was required. They did get on board 50 countries, including G20 countries, and that's a remarkable achievement, but they were a bit reluctant to tackle some of the hard AI problems that were emerging, and particularly the need to establish prohibitions on certain AI technologies. So around the same time that we were doing the work on the OECD AI principles, I was also working with people uh, such as uh, Dr. Lorraine Kisselberg to help draft uh, what we call the universal guidelines for artificial intelligence. And the universal guidelines were intended to cover a lot of the ground that the OECD AI principles simply didn't reach. Um, I'm very proud looking back now almost five years on the universal guidelines. I actually think that framework may be one of the most uh, important frameworks going forward. And we plan, in fact, this year uh, to celebrate uh, the fifth anniversary of the universal guidelines. So you have then the UNESCO recommendation on AI ethics adopted in 2021, comprehensive, 193 countries behind it. Very important. The OECD AI principles of 2019, the first global framework for the governance of AI endorsed by 50 countries, and the universal guidelines uh, for AI, which I think will continue to provide guidance uh, to policymakers going forward. A number of people have, uh, have suggested that uh, the generative AI applications that have been released since November the most of them do not really pass muster either under the OECD uh, principles, the UNESCO principles or, or the guidelines. And uh, I wonder how you feel about that. Well, it's an interesting comment. I'm not sure if it's accurate. Uh, and I have been involved with all three. So let me say generative AI was not anticipated in the OECD AI principles. Um, nor really in the UNESCO recommendation. Now, I will say about the universal guidelines, I'm not sure if we were aware of generative AI, but we do have in place several principles that are clearly relevant. There is, for example, in the universal guidelines, a termination obligation. Mm -hmm. And so many of the people today who are concerned about generative AI and existential risk could actually look back at the universal guidelines and say precisely that if it's uh, a matter of a loss of human control, then whoever has deployed the system has an affirmative obligation to take it down. Uh, we thought that was very straightforward. There are also uh, principles in the universal guidelines concerning data accuracy and data provenance 
and fairness that get to issues related to uh, bias and, and copyright and even cybersecurity, I think we included. So there, there's a lot in the universal guidelines. I know um, Marva has been working closely with the European Parliament on the EU AI Act, may also be able to say a few words about how the European Parliament um, addressed generative AI, which emerged uh, actually somewhat late in the process, I guess, of, of, of drafting the act. Merva, please. Uh, thank you, Bandel. And let me start with the overall, uh, like our general concerns, overall concerns with generative AI and then drill down to, um, to, to the European Parliament and EU AI Act. Some of these concerns we have included in our extensive comments at the F FTC complaint. However, the FTC complaint also only relates to FTC's enforcement powers, right? So. It doesn't, for example, include things like um, copyright issues, et cetera, because it doesn't fall under that's, um, that remit. When we look at generative AI systems, not so much the systems, but we're looking at the practices of the organizations who are developing and deploying these systems. And how do they actually uh, respect some of these norms? Uh, and governance structures. So first and foremost, the opaqueness of the business practices, which includes the curation of the data sets, development of the models and safety precautions uh, that have been taken throughout the model development and maintenance. As it stands, we don't have, uh, for example, much of an idea about the, the even the data set uh, provenance. Uh, or the size, or what has been done to process the data sets for, for example, chat GP or GPT-4, but that is not the only uh, product that is problematic. So we have this opaqueness that is pro preventing researchers as well as the regulators to get a better understanding of what's happening. Uh, representation within the data sets and uh, the bias that it would cause, uh, that is a known problem from AI and is being magnified with uh, generative AI systems. Uh, and we have already seen, whether it's in language models or image generators, the, uh, the biased results. We are concerned about privacy and data protection issues, uh, again, one from a training data sets development uh, piece. We don't know what kind of private, confidential, proprietary, copyrighted information that has gone into the systems to train them. But also there are uh, a lot of privacy and data protection processes and mechanisms that are missing from this, uh, from the current products. Um, unless you opt out, the default is your prompts are used to, to train the system. Uh, we have seen uh, issues where uh, the prompts have, or like the personal information, personal prompts have popped up in other users' um, uh, results. So that privacy and data protection is still not settled. Obviously there is an issue of accuracy, uh, you know, there, there, uh, I'm not comfortable with the word hallucination. I uh, would like to use inaccuracy uh, as, as a result of this, both the biased and, and the actual function of the system. Like when you're trying to, try to predict the next word in a thread, uh, you are using word embeddings and probability uh, and you're tuning or fine tuning the parameters. So that always results in inaccuracy. So these systems, generative AI systems should not be taken as ground truth or objective truths. Uh, there's a lot of cybersecurity and public safety um, concerns that we have, not only with um, generative AI systems being used to, being used for malicious purposes to develop malicious code or to inject malicious code, but also uh, how the systems can provide advice and detailed advice on things that can put the public safety at, in danger. Uh, in fact, if you go to OpenAI's uh, webpage and look at disallowed usage, 
there is a very, very long list of possibilities. Um, so acknowledging the risks and, and, and possible harms and the possible risk is one thing. Uh, we appreciate that. But how do you go about governing uh, those risks or putting guardrails in place? That is key piece. And uh, consumer protection is obvious another piece. Uh, you'll see, you'll have a number of organizations who are using these products, paying for these products and building models on top of it, but they don't have the control. They don't have any control about, uh, about the models, the, the main model, uh, nor do they have any access to the governance. So they're building on this opaque data sets and models uh, and taking on all the downstream risks. And then finally, uh, one of the biggest challenges for society at large is the deepfakes and disinformation and what these systems can do to uh, democracy, our democratic values, as well as uh, loss of trust in institutions and, and, and democracy at large. I appreciate you going through that list because I think for many in our audience, you see one issue or another come up in some abbreviated newspaper article, but uh, an appreciation for the breadth of concerns that are coming into, into play. And of course, that's not an exhaustive list. That's just one that's underscoring some of the most uh, serious issues. I gathered from what you said that, that uh, those concerns do have the attention of, of the EU, but what about the US government? Do you, do you have a sense that the US government is moving in any way to effectively address these concerns or, or is it really still caught up in political issues and perhaps corporate capture in a way where many of these issues may not get addressed at all? I think the US uh, policymakers it definitely captured their attention from White House to the Congress. Uh, that's for sure. Uh, you can see that with the flurry of AI policy activity and, and hearings on both sides, uh, both on the, on the Senate and the um, House side. Uh, however, uh, there is a bit of hype and we still uh, would like to see more diverse expertise to be heard in the hearings and more diverse group of people uh, to contribute to these discussions and the policy making use. Uh, as we mentioned at the beginning of the uh, conversation, you'll see um, more of the CEOs uh, come either testifying or going into this uh, closed door meetings. We would like to see uh, some of the experts who have been building governance models to contribute to the conversation. We like to see people who are impacted by these systems contribute to the conversations and invited to the, you know, whether it's uh, hearings, congressional hearings or uh, ex expert groups. So. There is definitely, like I said, um, it has caught the attention of the policymakers. Uh, White House created uh, PCAST, which is the Generative AI um, policy, policy Group. Uh, we've seen a number of Generative AI specific hearings uh, and task force built. Um, the, the, com, you know, the, the concern uh, on on top of everything that I said about generative AI systems is, as you mentioned, that we don't want this uh, policymaking to be captured by corporations. It has to reflect um, the concerns of both existing AI systems, as well as what generative AI has brought additionally to the table. Mark, let me put to you the question I get quite often, which is from what you've seen take place so far, are you generally optimistic or pessimistic that the world governments are going to move forward and effectively regulate artificial intelligence? Well, Wendell, I've often uh, been asked uh, that question, and I know you have uh, philosophy in your background. So I answer with uh, Pascal's wager, which is basically that it's better to be an optimist because 
the alternative is too grim to consider. Um, and I have seen over time, you know, there is there is progress made. It can be slow, and sometimes there are detours, and sometimes there are setbacks. Um, but just in the field of, of uh, AI policy in the last few years, for example, working at the OECD, you know, let's say um, even five years ago, it would have been impossible to imagine that UNESCO could have put together the comprehensive recommendation that they did, which was endorsed essentially by every country in the world. That was a remarkable achievement. And the big question now is what steps will be taken to implement. And on the US side, you know, for a couple of years where we felt that we were really, you know, wandering in the desert, um, there was to be sure good work underway in the White House through executive orders uh, across multiple administrations, by the way, but not much in the way of public participation or engagement or any real prospects for legislation. There has been a dramatic change over the last six months under the leadership of, of this administration that I see as very favorable. Um, but of course, oftentimes in the policy world, one of the biggest challenges you face is, is obtaining the goals that you've set out. And so even with a lot of uh, support behind you, you need to maintain a, a clear focus on the outcomes you're seeking. And, and much of our work these days, I would say, at, uh, at the center has been trying to ensure that we maintain our focus, even as the public becomes more aware of AI and as policymakers become more willing to consider legislation. Well, the good news is it seems we do have an inflection point now. This generative AI moment has really created an opportunity where it has captured the attention of leaders and we'll see how much how much effective action we can precipitate out of that. But Merv, when we when we look at your artificial intelligence and democratic values index, that seems to be focused very specifically on the policies of individual governments. And I'm wondering to what extent is the international governance of AI on the radar for CAIDP? Uh, it is very much on the radar about on AI and Democratic Values Index, as well as our uh, AI policy clinics, where we educate the participants on major AI policy frameworks. Uh, we would like to make sure that AI policymakers, current and future uh, policymakers in this field, understand uh, what has happened in the past, what are the existing commitments of the countries, such as OECD AI principles, UNESCO recommendations at this point, G7, G20 commitments, and not keep repeating or not keep trying to invent the wheel again and again with every hype, cy hype cycle. Uh, for example, US has been one of the leading uh, countries for OECD AI principles, uh, but we would like to see more of the implementation the US has recently become, uh, to our great excitement, uh, came back to UNESCO. Uh, so it will be crucial to see if UNESCO, US actually implements UNESCO AI recommendations in its future policy making. Um, so we would like to see these frameworks, uh, the major frameworks to be more uh, aligned uh, similarly, uh, I've been very much involved as the CIDP uh, as, as an official ex observer at Council of Europe uh, AI Treaty. Uh, we've been very much involved in these conversations. US is an observer country in Council of Europe, uh, is an observer state to the Council of Europe, and they are involved in uh, the treaty conversations as well. So we would like to see these prior commitments uh, to be reflected in the treaty as well. So as well in the AI Democratic Values Index, we continue to uh, reflect the updates in this AI policy framework. So it's not only the individual countries, but uh, these main frameworks at large. But like I said, at the end of the day, this work needs to be aligned and um, we cannot have 
know, disparate uh, and sometimes conflicting frameworks that apply to the same um, technologies and companies. Many of our listeners are going to be aware that the Carnegie Council, together with the IEEE SA, uh, put out a framework for the international governance of AI, a very uh, abbreviated framework, uh, about two weeks, which has been circulated broadly within the UN system and, and beyond. Mark, you had a chance to uh, review at least an early draft of of that, and I know that you were particularly interested in one of the proposed components, which was the creation of a robust uh, AI observatory. And I wondered if you could tell us a little bit more about what you think is needed there, what steps we might take forward, and why, given that there's also an AI observatory within the OECD, you nevertheless um, want to stress the importance of something a little bit more robust on the world stage? Right. Well, um, I thought it was a good proposal uh, from the Carnegie Council to create this uh, global observatory uh, based at the United Nations. And I, I think it's clear at this point that the United Nations under the leadership of the Secretary General does intend to establish uh, a global commission. Uh, the key question always in the development of, of these institutions and these frameworks is how do we maintain uh, complementary roles uh, for the different organizations so that there's not uh, you know, duplication or, or, or conflict. Uh, we know that the European Union will establish uh, comprehensive uh, legislation uh, through the EU AI Act, which is likely to replicate the Brussels effect of the, of the GDPR. Uh, we know that we have the principle-based approach at the OECD, UNESCO. We look forward to the AI Treaty at the Council of Europe. But I do believe a, a missing piece and that could be provided by the UN is, is the global observatory that you, Wendell, and, and others have, have proposed. I think uh, listening to the words of the Secretary General last week at the Security Council meeting, he talked about peace and security, which are fundamental to the UN, but he also talked about uh, fairness and, and accuracy and accountability in, in the context of, of AI. Um, so I'm I'm hopeful that this uh, proposal moves forward. I think it would be a, an important addition uh, to the governance of AI, and uh, looking forward to to news. Yeah, to be fair, we are not the only people talking about that, and indeed, uh, the, those recommendations came out of two workshops that we had convened at. Uh, at UNESCO and at the International Telecommunications Union. And among the participants was, um, was one member of, of the CAI uh, DP. So you were represented in those conversations. Also in those conversations was uh, Sir Jeff Mulgan, who had convened a separate group that had gone deeply into thinking through what in uh, global AI Observatory, GAIO, might, might look like. For those of you who are interest, interested further, if you go to carnegiecouncil.org, there is both the framework and a piece by Jeff and, and, and his committee that uh, talks a little bit more about the observatory idea. To just bring in one more element on that, I think we all would love to see something within the UN system that could facilitate communication, cooperation, and a degree of coordination. But it's clear already that the governance of AI is going to be distributed across many institutions. So this really is more about a communication, cooperation, and coordination function. And perhaps, for example, your index might be considered one of the elements or one of the tasks that's already being performed that does not have to be reinvented within, within another institution, but uh, continue to go on. We think that there are many other tasks that, for example, the IEEE may, may move to take up or, the, or UNESCO is taking up or the, uh, or the EU is taking up. So again, 
um, nobody's trying to put together, put forward models of what has to take place. I think we're, we're all trying to underscore what needs to be attended to and trying to look for the most constructive ways to attend to those concerns. Merva, is there something else you would like us to be talking about before we end this podcast? Something else uh, you'd like to underscore that you think you perhaps didn't give its due in our earlier discussion? Uh, uh, first of all, I appreciate the whole discussion, Randall. Uh, but I think one thing that I would like us to, uh, to leave with is the true global nature and meaningful, meaningful participation of uh, the global community and both the AI policy making and the governance of these technologies. We could have, for AI democratic values index, we could have just kept it as US and you know Western countries. We made a very international intentional effort to expand it to 75 countries to ensure the practices uh, and AI policy developments in Latin America, Africa, and Asia were accurately reflected. Similarly, we make a very intentional effort to develop the future AI policy leaders and researchers from those regions. Uh, like I mentioned, our participants in the AI policy clinics reflect more than 60 countries. In many cases, countries where there isn't any AI policy education uh, or is you know, not accessible or affordable by these participants. So, we talk about global nature uh, and borderless nature of these technologies, but we have to build capacity and focus on meaningful participation and engagement of these countries as well. So it cannot be only US and U Europe uh, driving these conversations. Mark, what would you like us to be aware of that hasn't come up yet? Well, I actually wanted to come back to a question you asked earlier, Wendell, you were talking about whether to be uh, an optimist about these topics. And, um, you know, it occurred to me uh, that Merva testified before a House uh, committee uh, just a few months ago, it's the beginning of March, actually. And the committee asked the question, um, you know, are we ready for the AI uh, revolution that's taking place. And I thought, you know, her answer uh, was excellent. Uh, she said, uh, we we weren't, we didn't have the guardrails in place, uh, the public education or the government expertise that, that we needed. Uh, but what we have seen in the U.S. over the last few months in response to uh, Merva's uh, testimony and, and the statement of others has been uh, remarkable progress. And so I think it's important as we talk about AI policy and the challenges that we're facing uh, for people to maintain uh, confidence about our ability to develop the necessary safeguards uh, we need. It is a little too easy, I'm afraid, uh, to just assume that the uh, AI systems are going to solve these problems for us. Uh, through all the work I've done over the last many years on this issue, people talk a lot about the need for AI to be human-centric. And if AI is going to be human-centric, that means that we are always, we will always need to be in charge and willing to take on whatever challenge uh, that means. So uh, let's maintain some confidence and, and let's uh, ensure that it is uh, the humans who uh, make the decisions. Is there a question you'd like to be asked or you know, something else you would like us to, to go into that we haven't covered? Well, I oftentimes include a little uh, advertisement at the end of a, of a conversation. So we certainly encourage uh, people to uh, visit us at our website, caidp.org and sign up uh, for our newsletter, the uh, CAIDP update. Uh, we're providing a lot of very good information uh, about what's happening in the world of AI policy. And uh, we look forward to the participation of, of many people in this work uh, through our clinics and other activities. Uh, we think it is a great uh, issue. It's cross-cutting. It affects all of us in different ways. Uh, and we want people to be involved. That's a great note to end on. 
Thank you ever so much, Merva and Mark, for sharing your time, insights, and expertise with us. This has indeed been another rich and thought-provoking discussion. Thank you to our listeners for tuning in, and a special thanks to the team at the Carnegie Council for hosting and producing this podcast. For the latest content in ethics and international affairs, be sure to follow us on social media at Carnegie Council. My name is Wendell Wallach, and I hope we earn the privilege of your time. Thank you.